What is the main indicator of economic activity? Think about the news. Politician speeches. What is the variable typically everyone talks about when the economy is under discussion? I would argue that GDP falls under this description. But what is GDP? Well, we can think of it in terms of the total amount of wealth that was created in a given country for a certain period of time. But this way of thinking about GDP is but one of the many ways we can think on how to calculate it. If we add all the values added per product, that is, we take all firm revenues and subtract the value of intermediate goods, we get to total wealth created. But all of this wealth is distributed between everyone who takes part in the production process and also the government. So if instead we add up compensations for labor in the form of wages, compensation for capital, typically profits, interest and capital depreciation, and net taxes, we get the same number. And once distributed this wealth, households, firms, and the government are going to use it, either in the consumption by both households and government and by investing. If, from this total, we correct for the differences in the total amount of goods that are exported and imported, again, we get the same number. These three ways of calculating the same number shows just how GDP reflects a myriad of economic activities, relationships between people, companies, and governments from different countries, all involving in creating wealth, distributing it, and putting it to use. But of course, there is a greater question that needs to be asked. Why so much focus by everyone on GDP? Underlying all this focus on GDP is the idea that it can be a proxy for welfare, that the more wealth is created, the more welfare people will enjoy. There is, of course, some degree of contention around this idea, but we will get back to it later. First, we need to understand exactly the relationship between wealth creation, measurement, and the role of GDP in proxying for welfare. Let's start by noting that between 1995 and 2015, GDP doubled in Portugal. Does this mean that people's welfare increased in the same magnitude? Well, no. And the reason is that most of the growth in GDP was nominal. Think about it for a second. If we double the price of every item in the economy, GDP will also double. But people will still enjoy the welfare brought by the same number of cars, televisions, hospital services, and everything else that makes up the GDP. So what matters is the change in GDP holding prices fixed. Once we do that, meaning once we compute the real GDP as opposed to nominal GDP, we actually see that Portugal's GDP increased a little over 20% in this 20 years period. Think about how GDP is distributed around the world. How can we perform such an exercise? GDP in Portugal is measured in euros, in the UK is measured in pounds, and in the US is measured in dollars. So how can we do that? Well, one way is to use market exchange rates in order to quote all GDPs in the same currency. If we do that, we find that the world GDP in 2014 was about $77.4 trillion. The European Union generated about 23.8% of this amount, the US 22.5% and China 13.4%. But if you want to think of GDP in terms of measuring welfare, we need to take into account also changes in prices between different countries. Before, we corrected GDP numbers for the fact that prices tended to grow over time. And we needed to take that out. But we also need to acknowledge that goods don't cost the same across the globe. And if we are to think of GDP in terms of welfare, we need to correct for the fact that the same $1,000 represent very different consumption possibilities if they were to be spent in New York, Lisbon, London, or Sao Paulo. If we do such an exercise, if we find average price levels per country and take that into account, we do something that is called correcting for purchasing power parity. As we do so, find it that China produces about the same amount of GDP as the EU 
or the US. Does this make sense? Well, we need to take another dimension also into account, the number of people. A cake can be big or small depending on how many people I have to share it with. The same with GDP. Once we take the population differences into account, meaning once we compute GDP per capita in purchasing power parity, we get the following plot, which probably confirms with some of your priors regarding relative welfare levels between different countries and regions of the world. But let's talk a bit about the idea of using GDP as a proxy for welfare. There are many things that have an impact on people's happiness, but that GDP does not take into account. GDP doesn't take into account the income distribution. Take a minute to think that the country with the highest GDP per capita in purchasing power parity is Qatar. Not any of the Scandinavian countries or Canada, typically the ones associated with the highest standards of living. It doesn't take into account leisure either. The US have higher GDP per capita than France, but France has a higher GDP per hour worked than the US. Where would you prefer to live? In a country where you need to work 60 hours per week to get 2,000 euros per month, or in a country where you can work 35 hours per week to get the same 2,000 euros. From the perspective of GDP, these are the same. Also, changes in quality of goods are not accounted for. Think that today a computer that can perform thousands of times faster, that can stream movies, display millions of colors, costs, and therefore counts for GDP, about five or 10 times less than a standard computer in the 1980s. That couldn't do either. Finally, how much income are you willing to forego in order to live in a country with little pollution, with institutions that protect your rights, and where you have the freedom to express yourself? None of this is directly captured by GDP, though anyone would argue these are key determinants of welfare. Behind GDP, there is a multitude of other dimensions, such as culture, leisure, safety, work-life balance, all of which are not, at least not directly, reflected in GDP. Which begs the question, why do we use it as a proxy for welfare then? Well, it happens that even being ridden with all these issues, when we ask people across countries how satisfied are they with their lives, it has a positive correlation with GDP. Materialism doesn't bring happiness, but indeed seems to help. Of course, there are cultural, even philosophical differences around the concept of being satisfied. Note that Portuguese have the same score in the Life Satisfaction Index as Kenya, though I would argue that if suddenly Portuguese would be forced to live under the same standards as in Kenya, their life satisfaction would be well below what they reported. These differences create a lot of noise in this relation. So let's look at other metrics, such as the Human Development Index, that takes into account objective measures of living standards, such as life expectancy. As we can see, the relationship is even stronger. We are onto something here. GDP seems to be strongly correlated with metrics that aim at capturing differences across countries in terms of living standards. To this, it adds the benefit of being comparable across countries in the way that is computed and also across time, not relying on ad hoc definitions of what constitute good living standards that can change over time and given the context. Note that under the notion that GDP is a good proxy for welfare across countries and time, is the idea that we can have a sense also for the impact of price changes in people's welfare, which begs the question of how to measure the general price level for an economy. In practice, the price level is measured by an index of average prices of different goods. There are many such indices, depending on the use one needs to make of it. To correct for GDP changes, the GDP deflator is usually computed. Whereas to see the impact of price changes on consumer welfare, the consumer price index, or the inflation measured based on personal consumption expenditure surveys are more often used. To compute the consumer price index, for example, we look at the representative consumer basket of goods. This means a basket of goods that people on average consume and look at its cost at base period prices, let's say 
2020. Then we look at the cost of the same goods in 2021. We divide both numbers by the value that was found for 2020, and we have built ourselves an index at 2020 base prices. For you to have an idea, in December 2018, this was the weight that each category of goods had in the representative basket. Housing was the largest component, contributing about 40% to the total index. With transportation and food and beverages coming next with 18% and 16% respectively. Just as with GDP, CPI also has problems in terms of adequately capturing the effect of changes in prices in consumer welfare. For starters, it doesn't take into account changes in the quality of goods. One item might be more expensive, not because of a pure price increase, but because the item is better and provides more use. There is also a lag in updating the weights of different goods to reflect changes in consumption patterns over time. And it's good to remember that the weights are computed based on total consumption expenditures of households, which means that households who are poorer and have different consumption patterns are underrepresented. Finally, there are also issues regarding which prices to consider. Should we look at the cost of the same pair of pants at designer stores or outlets? Regardless of these methodological issues, the necessity of having some measure of inflation that can reflect welfare impacts on households is there. All in all, both GDP and price metrics are imperfect proxies for the effects of wealth creation and price movements on welfare. But the fact remains, they are easier to compare both across countries and across time, are more objective than the alternatives. As such, we'll keep using them as key dimensions of all the analysis that we'll perform in this course. Thanks for watching.